So welcome back to the podcast. Uh, we have with me today, we have Jeremy Bassett of Super Benji. Um, we're going to ask him a lot of stuff about Super Benji, but Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me on, Dean. Looking forward to this. So so I met, I did, I've never met Jeremy in person, but I met one of his team, Sam, at an event in London. And I thought some of the stuff they're doing, uh, it kind of overlaps with what I do. So I thought it was pretty cool to have Jeremy on and talk about it, but also talk about outreach generally and, and where it's going, what's happening, what's changing. So Jeremy, do you want to do like a little bit of an intro into you and what Super Benji does so that people can get familiar with what you're all about? Yeah, sure. So Super Benji solves a big problem that we had in my old business. And I think a big problem that a lot of entrepreneurs and founders and salespeople have, and that is how do you engage in a highly personalized way at scale? Um, so what Benji does is, you know, if you think about what you do as a salesperson, Dean, you research each of your leads, uh, you understand what's going on in their lives, you find a reason to engage, you perhaps even start to think of a big idea that you might have for them, and then you pack all of that into a paragraph of an email. And that's really what Benji does hundreds of times every week for each one of our clients, um, personalizing at scale. But all of that came off the back of... Um, I sat on, I guess my background is two sides of the coin. So I was at Unilever for 14 years, having loads of startups pitching to me when I was leading the foundry. Uh, and so I saw the good, the bad and the ugly of biz dev coming from startups pitching to a large corporate. And, uh, and like most people that are in a buying position, we had, I had literally hundreds of emails every day coming in far too many to respond to. Uh, and so it really had to be a compelling message to get my attention. And then uh, when I left Unilever, I was a consultant. And as you know, consultants are very much bottom of the food chain when it comes to sales. Uh, no one really likes, uh, necessarily likes consultants or wants to get an email from them. And, um, and we had the big challenge of, well, how do we get in front of the world's largest brands and businesses and how do we get them to respond to us? And, and that was, you know, the flip side to that conversation, uh, that experience at Unilever of having to sell back in a company like, like Unilever. So given you've probably seen the good, bad and the ugly in your career of outreach messages, what do you think are some of the common like mistakes that people make that, you know, they seem so obvious after you point it out, but maybe nobody spots. Yeah. And then there's typos. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know what? Ironically, typos might almost prove that it's human now, uh, because I think we've seen. Um, it feels like the iteration of what makes a good email is changing on almost a weekly or a monthly basis. Um, but we have, you know, over the last, let's say, last decade, um, we've gone through very low-level personalization, where it's literally. It, it may be no personalization, which is just spam, to then including first name and uh, and perhaps company name into template messages. And then we've gone through a period of getting more sophisticated with template messages and, and understanding, well, okay, this group of people is from this particular industry, therefore they might be interested in this particular solution and, and templating uh, in that way. Uh, all of those you can start to see through. You know, little things that you and I would pick up on, like, the way they frame, they phrase our company, for instance, or um, the name they might have given me, or uh, the you know you can see that I've literally sucked information straight out of LinkedIn mm -hmm. and put it straight into a template and message. So I get little things like that. I get somewhere it's like as a chief executive officer. Yes, like who writes can, like that? Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> I think what happens is we kind of like. To try and appeal to multiple people, we put in these phrases that we would never actually say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and then those phrases are like moving from stuff that people might have pulled out from LinkedIn, like as a chief executive officer, to 
things that are clearly straight from GPT, like, uh, you know, I'm incredibly intrigued by the way you do something. Yeah. And I, I mean, oh, no in one's the really fast paced world of global. Yes. <laughs> Well, my favorite one was from GPT-3, where uh, it used to churn out in a post-pandemic world. We need, <laughs> and this is like earlier this year. So, um, you know, I think hopefully we've moved beyond post-pandemic. Um, but unfortunately, some of the large language models haven't yet. <laughs> so, so given you've got this kind of language issue, right? But at the same time, you know, the challenge, well, let me just, let me just throw a bomb. Jeremy and and see where, we go. see where it lands. <laughs> Do you, I I sometimes look at some companies and look at their outreach and go, I'm not sure why you needed a salesperson to be behind this because it it does feel like a lot of the outreach they're doing is just literally templates from a marketing department plugged into somebody's email account, and they're just picking up whatever they can get. It yeah. doesn't feel like a skill game anymore. It feels like just a yeah. total volume game. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I, it feels like for a few years we've been playing the lowest common denominator numbers game. Yeah. Yeah. Do unfortunately, I think sales teams have been targeting the wrong things. And like you said, Dean, it, it really comes down to perhaps targeting quantity. And that's just not the right thing. Um, and it's driven a lot of people down this road of, well, let's just get them out there, uh, less personalization, uh, make it hit the numbers type thing. And of course, that just clogs up inboxes. Uh, it uses a huge amount of data and infrastructure, and, and it doesn't get the results that anyone really wants or needs. It also, you know, you have to think about how a relationship starts, it's often how a relationship finishes. So. If you're going in with a highly transactional volume-based email, you're probably going to get highly transactional volume-based um, customers coming on board that are not necessarily the best customers or the highest paying customers in the world either. So taking a much more relational approach to the way you sell will hopefully result in a much more relational approach to the customer base you attract. So you've got to outreach you've got to, you've got to do it. There's no ifs or buts about it. What's your take on kind of multi-threading where you're using different platforms at different stages of outreach? So that's a great question because I think, you know, most platforms that are most AI tools or sales tools that are out there at the moment focus on one particular platform. And as a human being, you know, if I really wanted to talk to Dean, I would find a way to talk to Dean. So I would look at, okay, are you active on LinkedIn? Yes, you've got a great LinkedIn profile. Um, let's go with LinkedIn. Oh, your email is on your website or I can have um, a good guess at it or find it from another source. Uh, let's also follow that up with an email. Uh, I might go on to LinkedIn. I might look at what you've been posting and like and comment on those posts. I do anything to sort of get my name high on your radar and for you to see that this guy, Jeremy, is really keen to talk and the level of intent is quite high and he's done his research and he has an idea that's potentially quite relevant to me. So all of those things played out across multiple channels show a high level of intent. So you get this thing where one plus one equals three. You know, it's not just LinkedIn. It's not just email. It's both of those tools working simultaneously to deliver that one plus one equals three effect. Uh, and I, when I'm when I'm doing my workshops, and I know when I chatted to Sam in London, he was saying something very similar. It's like we think like we often think about like outreaches about copy, and the copy yeah. of the messages is important, but how it lands, when it lands, and I, I you know what that person feels like because of how it's landed. We never really appreciate those kind of little things. Like you were saying there, the one plus one equals three. Mm. The fact that you've engaged with somebody on LinkedIn before you've sent outreach. People underestimate the power of that kind of little touch points before the heavy touch points. Yeah, they really do. And it makes a big difference. You know, if, if you can show someone you've taken time to 
read their blogs or listen to their podcasts or um, go into detail on their website or appreciating the things they're putting up on social um, platforms that you know that creates reciprocity and, uh, and and people generally pay that back you know I know for me um, I had a call from from uh, Revolut you know very large bank mm -hmm. uh, trying to get us to do B2B banking with them and uh, the guy there you know first of all he makes mention of the podcast, a podcast that I'd spoken on. Uh, and then he follows that up in the first call with, hey, Jeremy, I, was, I loved your podcast, sort of reiterating what he said in the email. At that point, he could have just been saying that. But then he follows it up with a question from the podcast, um, which shows me that he was not only listening, uh, or not only saw it, he was also listening and actively listening so that he could engage with it via a question. So those are sort of the little things that create an immediate bond with someone They're like, Oh, you actually care about me. Um, when you get on that first call. So question for you, cause I know some salespeople and maybe some sales leaders are going to come back on that and go, yeah, but the challenge is, and it's like a scale, isn't it? It's like I could invest more time in my prospects, but I could be investing in stuff that's not going to convert. So, or versus I don't invest any time in them. I just create a spreadsheet and go for it. Yeah. And I get something. How, what's your thoughts on that whole piece of the, the worry that you invest time in doing something that's a bit more personalized that potentially could come to nothing? Not get a response. This is the biggest frustration for any salesperson is investing and not getting a return on that investment. And it happens all the time. You know, when I was in CoCubed, we went from um, the consultancy businesses that I was in before Super Benji, we went from founder-led growth to team-led growth. And the team initially were really excited about engaging with clients, reaching out, prospecting, all of that sort of stuff, until they realized it's actually just a huge amount of hard work. And, uh, and, and to be honest, a lot of no's, a lot of re rejections. It requires a huge amount of resilience. I think salespeople are the most resilient, determined, optimistic people in the world. And, and if you're not, you're really going to struggle in sales. So, um, so it's tough. But what we realized is that, and, our, and my team pushed back on that as much as any other team. They, they, went, they went at it hard for a few months and then they said, look, this is just a nightmare and it's, it's really challenging. And, and to be honest, it's not what we signed up for. And so like any good leader, Dean, I said, well, you know, you're being paid to do this, just suck it up. <laughs> and that, that motivational pep talk didn't quite work. And so then what we said is, can we automate this? And what we realized is that what we can do is what we call at Benji, a Super Benji, we call it sales done backwards. So Benji does all the research for you. He identifies the podcast you could have listened to, the blogs you could have read. He reviews their website in great detail. He comes up with a big idea that you could be pitching to them. He puts all of that into a, a sequence of emails and LinkedIn messages that go out to different clients. As soon as you get a response, Benji then sends you a briefing pack that includes all of the details and the research he's done to help you write that email. And he gives you some questions, a synopsis, for instance, of a, a, a podcast. And then he'll give you a question to ask to follow up from the fact that um, they've given that podcast and it shows that you're engaging in their subjects and interested in what they do. So it sells on backwards. It's basically, we don't, it, it doesn't mean you don't research on the prospects. It just means you research on the prospects that reply to you. Mm -hmm. um, so Benji takes, does the research, gets a reply, then gives you the research to go through that in detail before your first call. So that when you get on that first call, you've, you spent perhaps an hour writing that message or it's kind of, it's kind of like a hybrid, isn't it? Is, is that chicken and egg? Do I do the research and outreach and risk wasting a lot of time? Do yeah. I do no research? It's kind of like, I'll do something that's kind of at a level. And then if I get a response, go, go in way more depth and, and dig in. Really double down. Exactly. And, and double down to the extent that, you know, you might spend, an hour or more preparing for that call and really understanding the person, their point of view. Um, so that when you get on that first call, it's much more than an exploratory call. 
uh, it's really crystallizing that relationship that you've started on on email or LinkedIn. So two two years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do this, right? <laughs> no. No, even uh, well, definitely two years ago. And then it's getting better. I mean, it's getting better every week. So um, as LLMs improve, as data availability improves, as APIs improve, uh, we're able to pack all of that into each message. But yeah, we're very much... Um, an AI first business, you know, we launched this year in January, 2024, uh, where, you know, it's still very much the early days for us, but um, it's been fascinating though, Dean, going on this journey because you can start to see, you know, how transformative AI really will be. It's not just transforming legacy businesses. It will give rise to a huge number of new businesses that will transform the way we work as well. So it's super exciting. I, I was at um, an event uh, last year, uh, end of last year, and uh, no, beginning of this year, actually. Sorry, it's, this year's gone so fast. Beginning of yeah. last year, and somebody was presenting, they said, um, I've been an AI expert, I'm an AI expert, and I've been doing AI for 14 months. And it's... Yeah. <laughs> that is, I mean, outside of the kind of, you know, these big supercomputer people, the mainstream day-to-day -day people, yeah. um, AI is such in its infancy. And mm. I was reading the other day, like 16% of the population have actually used AI. Mm. So it's still a tiny amount of people who are actually using it. Yeah. And then I don't know whether you've seen this um, recently, but uh, Taco Bell have decided that their drive throughs are going to be run by AI. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, Interesting. how does that even work? Like, yeah, is it yeah, a robot yeah. arm delivering the food? Or, I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> but it is, it is, it is really exciting and and really scary. And I want to kind of throw. I'm not a doom, you know, Terminator Two, Judgment Day kind of. I'm not in that camp. I think there's great uses of AI, and I use it every day myself. But I do think that it is going to displace some people. Yeah. And like in sales, for an example, I don't think it's going to replace good salespeople. I really don't. No. But I do think if your sales skill is just relying on email replies or and you don't have that persuasiveness and the skills of going on calls and that stuff, I think mm -hmm. you are at risk of being replaced. So, yes, I'm not dissing your till, Jeremy. I'm saying no. it is awesome. <laughs> But what I'm saying is that if you as a seller are not very good in the skill set of understanding humans, relating to humans, uh, you know, listening, all that kind of stuff, you are replaceable. The human element yeah. is is where you should be excelling. Exactly. Yeah, it's like anything, right? I mean, like business, jobs, anything. What's your USP? What's the thing that makes you unique? Uh, and your ability to be able to connect with people, to build that relationship. I mean, that is unique. You can't You can't automate that. Um, the, I, I think, um, a couple of other things to say on that, Dean, one is, you know, AI will augment you. So if you're good, AI will make you even bit better and help to scale you. Uh, and then the second thing to say is, you know, I don't think AI is replacing humans, but humans who use AI are replacing humans who don't. And this is, you know, a phrase that's kicked around quite a lot and something we hold to at Super Benji. Uh, we're really keen of empowering the next generation of salespeople with AI skills that they can use to help supercharge their growth. Mm -hmm. We're not keen to replace anyone, but we're keen to make sure that those people who are trained up and can use AI are themselves irreplaceable. Um, I, I think the other thing is, you know, at the moment, AI is replacing a lot of things that we just don't really enjoy. So doing that huge amount of work is fairly soul destroying for anyone, including SDRs. Um, getting on a call with a potential client and moving things forward from there is actually kind of the fun part of what we do in sales. So uh, I think the more we can empower people to do the parts of the job that they love and using AI to do that, that's important. And then, do yeah, sorry. Think, yeah. Just as a as a a thought process here, do you do you think that there's potentially AI countermeasures coming? 
In in what way? In terms of so so I'm just I, I'm just I'm just spitballing here, but you know our inboxes are difficult to manage. Yeah. Do you exactly. think that somehow AI will plug in to kind of help the recipients, you know, uh, buyers filter and manage their inboxes? In which case, will that me that skill game that skill threshold is going to go higher? Yeah, that's uh, absolutely right. In, in fact, I mean, it already has been happening for the last few years in many ways. You know, with spam filters, the way that spam filters work, it's basically using a whole bunch of AI to help optimize our inboxes for us. Just because I send you an email doesn't mean that it goes into your inbox. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so yeah, you've got both sides of the equation at play here. You've got things that are designed to get things into inboxes and inboxes that are designed to keep things out of inboxes. And both these tools are going head to head. Uh, it's challenging as a salesperson because, you know, you might have a very strong proposition, but if you pitch it slightly the wrong way with a few words that spam filters are likely to pick up on, uh, you could easily get sent to um, a spam box or a junk mail or, or perhaps not even get delivered in the first place. So uh, it's tricky. And that's where, you know, you really need leading edge AI tools to help navigate that or um, the skills, as you said, of a salesperson uh, to make sure you're working around that. Mm. And um, uh, thinking about what you're doing at the moment, you're, you're 14 months down the road. Uh, Sam's actually sent me some tests that I've not used yet, but I am going to use this week and I'm going to send you the feedback. But they, uh, I saw them and, I, and he, I went through them briefly on a call with him and he was saying like, we took, I think it was 20 prospects and it did the research on them, crafted the emails. And I said to him, other than a few little bits of tweaks, and I always think it's worth tweaking emails anyway, they were li like pretty good. And I was like, this is pretty good if, you know, if, but my question is at the moment you're running it as a kind of done for you service, but your plan is to launch a self-service at some point, right? Yeah, exactly. So we want to make this as easy for as many people to use as possible. And, and we thought initially that was by, you know, holding people's hands and onboarding them. We think we can, with the help of Benji, get the onboarding process to be super simple, very intuitive and accessible for anyone. And so we're currently building a platform um, that should go live by the end of this year in that space. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a very easy tool for anyone to check out and, and try. In fact, right now we've got a demo live with Benji where you literally type in your email. From your email, he understands who you are, what you do, what your comp company does. He understands, uh, what a company like yours is trying to sell. And then from there, he starts to think, well, who would you be trying to sell that to? And he helps identify your ICP. Uh, he then identifies the company that you'd like to be selling to, the job title and the person you'd like to be selling to. And then he starts to look at, well, what are they interested in? What are the things that would make them want to get an email from you? And then he starts to look at, well, what's this person being up to? What are the hooks that I could engage with? Um, that would make sense for them to get an email from you. Uh, and within, you know, a matter of um, not a huge amount of time, Benji can do that whole piece of research, put together a whole info pack and send it to you. So send you like an ideal lead and a fully drafted four step sequence. Um, and this is just the beginning, Dean, in terms of where we're going with AI. So you can imagine, you know, this is what we've achieved with a small team here in Oxford, tapping into some amazing technology. You can imagine what's going to happen over the next 12, 18 months, five years, 10 years in the world of sales. Uh, it's going to be an amazing uh, journey to watch. And when do you think schools are going to teach about AI, Jeremy? <laughs> well, uh I wish I had it when I was at school. My goodness, I might have passed. Um, <laughs> I, I just like, I just, I just like, I don't even think it's on the curriculum yet. And it's like scary how slow our education system is. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, I, it's right. You're right. I think um, our kids really need to get up to speed with this. Um, you know, prompt engineering is still a skill that needs to be learned, for instance, for today's AI tools. And, and who knows what needs to be done? in the future, but 
I think we all need to get comfortable with this from kids right through to adults. As um, Sam Altman says, you know, the pace of technology is now well and truly uh, outpacing our ability as humans to adopt that technology. <laughs> and so our job as entrepreneurs and business leaders is to create solutions that are so easy, so intuitive for people to be able to use that they can adopt the leading edge technologies today. Yeah, I mean, I remember when, you know, ChatGPT came out, like, what was that, uh, January 2023, was it? Something like that, something like that. And within about a few months, there was like a, you know, you were getting messages from all these different tools that were using AI that just suddenly sprung up. And you, yes, you know, yeah. I know, like, oh, you went to university, Loughborough University. That must have been a fantastic experience. I saw that some other random person went there. <laughs> <laughs> you're right about or sam's right about that in terms of like the pace of what you can do i mean i made my i made an avatar of myself in three minutes right yeah <laughs> i recorded myself for three did it have that cool shirt you're wearing dean as well uh, it was a different shirt but yeah <laughs> um, but I, I literally recorded myself for three minutes and then literally i could type in and i could make myself say anything mm. right and I'm just thinking, this was like deep fakes, um, you know, just 18 months ago, two years ago, this was like evil people on the internet using yeah. things. And now it's like, you can go online and do a free trial and do it. Mm. And I just, I just find it fascinating that if somebody's been like hiding in the bunker, waiting to see what happens with this hate AI thing, yes, it's like, whoa, <laughs> like it's insane. I mean, I've got, I've got a GPT, a Dean GPT now that I built myself. It took me half an hour, 40 minutes. Yeah. And literally I've uploaded all of my head knowledge that I've ever expressed anywhere on the internet into a GPT. And I can now just go write me a post about this. And it's just, yeah. And it's all what Dean would say, even down to the way I would say it. And it's scary. It is amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. I mean, it's scary, it's exciting, there's opportunities, of course there's fears. Um, and it, it feels, you know, when I went to university, I started um, uni in 2001, and it was just when the internet was sort of, you know, going mainstream, if you like. You come out of research labs, and, um, and the whole world was being reinvented, and it feels like that again. You know, these sort of cycles come around every 10 or 20 years, and, and this is a real opportunity for people to get on board, to start putting these tools to work, um, start playing with them for themselves and to see how they can use it to augment what they do. I think the adoption here will be much faster than what we saw for the internet. I think the use case is much stronger as well. Mm. You know, there's a really clear business case for using this. It saves time, it saves money, it gets results. Um, we were talking to one sales guy, he's like, this is more human than my humans. Uh, <laughs> when he looked at Benji. Uh, and so, you know, if you're not putting it to work, uh, you, you're, you're at risk of being left behind. But the good news is it's easy to try it out. You know, it's not overly complicated. I, how, what was your experience like, Dean, with creating the GPT? It, it, was, it, was, it was so easy. I thought I was doing something wrong. Right. Do yeah. You know, like when you're building the IKEA furniture and you start putting it together, and you go, "This isn't too bad," and then you end up with like pieces left over, and you go, "Yes." Yeah. Like, it wasn't like that. It was like, uh, "Just tell me what you want." Yeah. Like, and I just said, "This is what I want." Here's all the documents. Uploaded it all, and it was like ready yeah. to roll. It's just yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Whereas, and, and that's sort of uh, UI that we're trying to build into. Super Benji, where you literally put in your email, nothing else, not even your name, no details on your company, what you're trying to do, and it finds you a lead and writes a four-step sequence for them. So I think this is going to get easier and easier as well. But yeah. It's exciting. So so Jeremy, you're you're pushing out super who who's your target for Super Benji? I mean, obviously everybody needs to do outreach, but who's who's who the who's it best suited for? Yeah, we we find that um, we've got clients from Coca-Cola and Morgan Stanley through to uh, a consultancy that l launched two months ago and everyone in between. Uh, it's for anyone in B2B sales that has high value deals that require a lot of VIP treatment. 
Um, and that's where we're getting a lot of success. Uh, it, um, which is still quite a broad audience, to be honest. But we we initially started on uh, consultancies just because that's my background. We've then gone into wealth management, uh, like Morgan Stanley and Deutsche Bank, as well as M and A um, mm. leaders as well. And then uh, on the roadmap, near roadmap is recruitment and mm. uh, things like that as well. We think we can do a much stronger job of matching uh, talent with recruiters um, than what's currently happening. And, uh, and if we can do that, we can really start to augment what recruiters do and bring a much better experience to the people they're trying to reach. Oh, that could be interesting. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see you've got some experience with this and this project. I've got a role coming up that's similar to that. It could be like really clever there. You could see how that Yeah, could be. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it also being able to match hundreds of roles with hundreds of or thousands uh, with thousands of candidates and, and then being able to write those sort of messages. So not and fast as well, because th this fast. is the other thing with the recruitment world is, you know, there is, there is a shortage of good quality people in pretty, pretty much all the, you know, the, a lot of the big industries. Exactly. So the speed of being able to do it and find people and talk to them fast yes. could give a recruiter a massive advantage over say a competitor. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, time is essence. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, this has been fab. I'm going to put a link to your uh, site so people can go and check it out. Um, so I'll also put a link to your uh, LinkedIn so that people can come and ask you questions there. Um, Jeremy, um, one final thought. Do you think AI will replace you? <laughs> uh, I hope for some things it does. Uh, and there's, of course, a lot of things that um, it won't. But, um, yeah. The one Sorry. thing I'm holding out for is a fully AI VA that I can just talk to. Yeah. That would be fantastic. I, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? I don't think that's too far away either. Um, I think that something's a bit further away, though, that I would like to have replaced is my ability to dance on the dance floor. So if I can get an AI to take that job for me, I'd, I'd have to adopt that as well. <laughs> awesome jeremy thanks for coming on uh guys we'll put jeremy's details below please go check it out if you've got any questions about super benji go and ask jeremy uh like i said uh, i've done a little trial with it the messages that came out of it are incredible it's worth a try because uh, i think it's it's ingenious what he's doing so jeremy thank you thanks so much dean great to be here